Green Dragon Tavern, Boston, 1768. The Sons of Liberty have gathered to lift tankards in solidarity. They do so surrounding a silver bowl filled with rum punch, made by one of their members, Paul Revere. Another among them is a malter named Samuel Adams, who produces the cerealized mixture sold to brewers to make beer. And across from him is John Hancock, a merchant specializing in importing Spanish wine. They swill American beer and rum, talking about how new British laws have impacted their lives. The Sugar Act squeezed the rum business, trade restrictions kept the colonists from selling their products, including alcohol, abroad, and now they have to quarter British soldiers in their homes, barns, and stables, and were legally required to give them five pints of beer a day. In retaliation, Boston brewers have instituted a boycott, refusing to buy British malt. The colonies are drinking their way toward revolution. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for helping us bring this history to the table. By the 18th century, Europe was barreling toward revolution, and the Green Dragon Tavern was not alone as a center for dissent. During both the American and French revolutions, rebels organized themselves around taverns and other drinking establishments, and later beer halls would serve a similar role in the revolutions of 1848. But another revolution was taking place at the same time, one centered on the process of making beer. See, for most of history, beer had little competition. Apart from grape-producing regions where wine was cheap enough for common people to enjoy, there just wasn't another commercial beverage that could compete with it. But now, there were tons, with the increasing global trade network bringing more options. Coffee, originally from Ethiopia, and that you can learn more about in our History of Coffee series here, had made its way through Europe. Not to mention, tea had arrived on the scene from China, and Europe had even gotten a taste for the Aztec practice of drinking chocolate. But the biggest rival of beer was distilled spirits, which began circulating in the 13th century as medicine and named with nebulous terms like strong waters or aqua vitae. And a few centuries of experimentation meant that by the 18th century, brandy, rum, gin, and whiskey were not only commercially viable products, but increasingly tasted way better than years prior. So if you wanted to get drunk, and no ifs, ands, or buts about it, the early modern Europeans most assuredly did, spirits got the job done a lot faster and at a lower cost though with a lot more danger as well. During the gin craze of the 18th century, London started seeing a level of drunkenness it had never experienced before. People were dying of alcohol poisoning, a thing almost impossible to do with lower-strength beers common at the time. Drunk Londoners were dying in gory accidents, losing their businesses, and even selling their or their children's clothes to buy gin. And while this created a moral panic about drunkenness in the lower classes, and it's always about the lower classes, I mean, members of parliament were actually admired for their ability to give speeches while drunk, this moral outcry also provided cover for beer. In contrast, beer was seen as wholesome, even healthy. In 1751, English artist William Hogarth published The Prince, Beer Street, and Gin Lane to make an explicit side-by-side -side comparison. On Gin Lane, the people are dying skeletal zombies. A carpenter pawns his tools as buildings fall apart, while violence and crime are rampant. Meanwhile, over on Beer Street, the only one going out of business is the pawnbroker. Everyone is rotund, happy, prosperous, patriotic, and glowing with health and virality. And not only was beer supposedly healthy, it was entering a new era of innovation. Large brewers were starting to produce it in larger volumes, and new types of beer popped up all over Europe. Crucially, these were not created using additives, but rather by innovations in the process of fermentation. In the 1760s, a new series of technologies appeared that meant beer could be produced with greater consistency and control. Steam engines made large-scale factories easier to manage, thermometers and hydrometers meant beer could be monitored for temperature and consistency while brewing, and the drum roaster, created in 1817, sealed out the smoky flavor malts acquired by roasting directly over wood, straw, or a coal concentrate called coke. One of these new exciting beers arose in England just before the gin craze. By the 1720s, London brewers were selling a new brew called Porter, a name that supposedly arose because it was popular among the porters that carried loads on the streets and docks. Made with a dark malt and heavily hopped, it was delicious, cheap, and lasted for months. Porter beer traveled all over Europe, but it was in Ireland where it made its biggest impact. There, breweries began making it particularly strong, or extra stout, in the language of the time and Irish brewers often used malt that had been cooked until it was crisped, giving the thick beer a deep black color. And one brewer became so famous for it, his name has become forever linked with the drink, Arthur Guinness. Though another fan of stout was Catherine the Great, who insisted that her court be supplied with the best English beer. 
Supposedly, English sailors found that beer shipped to Russia tended to freeze, and in response, developed a brew with a high enough alcohol content to prevent ice from forming. Thus, the story goes, Russian Imperial Stout was born. Though that wasn't the only beer created by a sea voyage. Pale ales, a golden or amber-colored ale, had arrived around the same time as Porter. It's a beer the East India Company was interested in, given that Porter was too heavy for company officials and troops serving in the heat of the subcontinent. So they went to a brewer named George Hodgson, who was just up the river from their docks. After experimenting with other beers, he tried making a well-known brew called October Ale. This was a heavily hopped autumn beer that was supposed to mature in the cask for a year, before being bottled to mature for another year. But Hodgson got extremely lucky. The conditions of heat and agitation on the four-month journey to India sped up the maturation process, and it arrived ready to drink. And though his sons went on to lose the contract, a rival brewery recreated the formula, which by then was already known as India Pale Ale. Yet beer innovation was not the sole province of the English. Most German beers had traditionally been lager, a name derived from a process called lagering, which meant letting them ferment in basements under relatively low temperature. One type, Doppelbach, was even left out to freeze in winter and the ice discarded in order to concentrate it. These beers were often dark and sweet, but that was changing. In the early 1930s, Gabriel Sidumeyer of the Spaten Brewery in Munich traveled Europe in hopes of learning how to modernize the German brewing industry. Supposedly, he even engaged in industrial espionage, stealing malt, hops, and beer samples from the British breweries and hiding them in a cane. When he returned, he adopted thermometers, installed the first brewery steam engine in Germany, and tried making a pale ale with the process of lagering, thereby inventing pale lager. Another Bavarian brewer, Josef Grohl, decided to iterate on pale lager at his own brewery in Pilsen, in what is now the Czech Republic. That resulting beer would be named after his city, Pilsner. This pale lager, or Pilsner, some use them interchangeably, exploded. Light and refreshing, it was the perfect type of drink for warmer climates. Bavarian brewers then took it to the United States, where it became the leading style, and German immigrants also took it to Mexico, where most beers are still lagers, and garnished it with local touches like lime, salt, and chili powder. Now, trust me, Rob and I could go on like this for hours, and we have in private meetings, but you get the point. By the mid-19th century, there were more beers available than ever before, and in greater quantities. And breweries were no longer at-home operations, but large industrial factories. For example, in 1814, a series of rusting tank rings at a brewery in London gave way, flooding the district with beer, wiping out multiple buildings, and killing eight people. Yeah, that's how much beer they were making. Enough to cause a natural disaster. But a happier thing happened a few years earlier in 1810. A wedding. On a fine October day, Crown Prince Ludwig married Princess Therese on a meadow outside Munich. They held a parade and days of horse racing, with beer of course present in abundance. It was so fun that they decided to do it again the next year, and the year after that, and the year after that. In fact, apart from cancellations due to wars and epidemics, it's been held every year since, both in Munich and in German communities all over the world. You probably know it as Oktoberfest, and I've been to a few. But German immigrants would carry more than drinking festivals abroad. So join us next time as humanity finally discovers yeast, the temperance movement leads to a crusade against alcohol, and a German immigrant, fresh out of the Union Army, creates the largest beer company in the world. Ah, uh, what a bud. Now, Zoe, before we dive into the research for our final episode of the history of beer, it's probably a good idea to get some food in our stomachs, you know? Right on time, HelloFresh. What's HelloFresh, you ask? Why, it's a tasty meal kit delivery service that can keep your belly super happy while also saving you a bunch of time by eliminating tedious trips to the grocery store and stressful meal planning. You get all of the ingredients you need to prepare delicious meals delivered right to your door, and you're eating in a half hour or less. Now, with 50 different meal options available each week, I'm always excited to try out new flavors. However, the second I saw their pork bulgogi bowls back on the menu, I snatched those up right quick because I've been dying to make them again. They are so good. Whereas Jeff copied my reordering homework and doubled down on his springtime specialty of citrus pork tacos for out on the patio, which meant Zoe and I only had to hop two fences to take part. I mean, if he didn't want us there, why would he keep ordering the family size? Fence hopping fitness aside, another thing HelloFresh gets right is their continued work on the sustainability and freshness fronts. Their produce goes from farm to your front door in under a week. The ingredients are all pre-portioned, which means less food waste. And the carbon footprint of their service is actually 25% smaller than that of meals made from store-bought groceries. And now is an awesome time to try HelloFresh for yourself because they've lined up a very delectable deal. All you gotta do is go to HelloFresh.com and use the code extra credit 16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts, all with free shipping. 
Oh yeah, you heard me right, hungry people. You can get a ton of free food while supporting the content you love, the environment, and most importantly, your grumbly tummy. Again, that's 16 free meals and three surprise gifts at HelloFresh.com using the code extra credit 16. Your time and taste buds will thank you. And once again, so will we. Thanks so much. The biggest EC thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angela Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles One for being fantastic legendary patrons.